Sumerian army officers. What does this bunch of poor, feeble Jews think they are doing? Mm -hmm. Do they think they can build the wall in a day if they offer enough sacrifices? Look at those charred stones they are pulling out of the rubbish and using again. Tabar the Amorite, who was standing beside him, remarked that that stone wall would collapse if even a fox walked along <laughs> the top of it. <laughs> then I pray, hear us, O oh, uh, oh God, oh God, for we are being mocked. May their scoffing fall back on their own heads, and may they themselves become captives in a fallen land. Do not ignore their guilt. Do not blot out their sins, for they have provoked you to anger here in the presence of the builders. Stop right there. Perfect. Okay. Um, <clears throat> Sanballat, um, he starts to insult the workers. And it says, you know, he's, he's saying this in the presence of his associates and the army of Samaria. Now, um, where are they in proximity to the wall? Somebody overheard this, and that's why Nehemiah was right, right, ate this down. He was able to write it down. Uh, this is what this guy was saying. And very specific to what he was saying. Right? It's, it's just interesting, the, 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 the detailed information here. And uh, the first thing he does, he calls the workers pretty much weak. Right? These feeble Jews. What are, what are they doing? Um, and then, then he asks these questions. Uh, you know, will they... Will they restore this? Will they be able to re truly rebuild this thing? Uh, will they sacrifice? Uh, that implies what? Uh, it, it's going to take more than prayer and worship to rebuild. Um, he, he just knows th this is a major thing to do. Spiritually, physically, the sacrifice is going to be required. And he's making fun of their building materials. He says they're using, you know, pretty much, you know, rubbish. They're, they're building with the old stuff that was burned and destroyed. Well, they, we also know they've got, they've got new materials, but I'm sure they're, you know, they're scavenging for what can be still used. Why not? Right? If it's useful. Um, and then the question is, are they going to finish this in a day? I mean, they're, they're working. Uh, they claim they're going to get this thing done, and it's just nothing but insult. Um, and then, you know, Tobiah, he, he also ridicules... Uh, the, the finished product um, as it's going up, and I say the, the weight of a fox it, it is going to be enough to knock it down. So, Nehemiah, how's he respond? What's verse 4 and 5? What are those? Pray. It's a pray, a prayer. He prays, he asks God to do what? Okay, what else? What's, what's his specific request of God? Turn the insults back on them. Uh huh. The, 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 the bad luck they're wishing for us, I pray you give it to them. Return that on their heads. What else? Give them over as plunder in a land of captivity. What does that mean? Take them captive. Let somebody captivate them. Yeah. Right, like we were. The thing that happened to us in Babylon, let it happen to them. Let them go into captivity. All right. Uh, don't cover their guilt. You know, don't forgive them. Don't, don't let their sins be blotted out from your sight. For they have hurled insults in the face of the builders. Now, that's a fairly normal prayer for most of us, uh, for our enemies. God, get them. You know, now Jesus teaches us a different way to pray. Pray for our enemies. Yes. We're supposed to forgive them. Yes. Um... Is that for every single situation? Do you think there's ever a situation that um, Jesus would not expect you to pray for your enemies? I was going to say to a point, and maybe that what that point was reached with them. Could you think of any enemies that you would not pray for? Maybe you should not pray for. Well, if, if I were being, or my family was being attacked and it looked like the end was, was imminent, 
and I was praying for my own safety and the safety of my family, <clears throat> I would be praying against those other guys, wouldn't I? I would be asking God to squelch that. Take them out. Yep, yeah. Correct. Thank you. To that, it's been mentioned that you should pray for the people in Gaza. Uh, that, uh, uh, and I understand that, uh, as well as the Israeli people, but uh, uh, as long as it's clarified toward the, the people of Gaza that are uh, victims rather than haters and killers of the Jewish faith. Would you agree with that? You're not answering. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> yeah, I mean, so, okay, well, when G Jesus tells us, you know, love your enemies, I say love your enemies, pray for those who persecute you. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, you really have to ask yourself, is that all the time. He didn't qualify it. He just said, I mean, that's how it is. Yeah. Love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. Now, chances are you don't have an opportunity to love your enemies. You can't show love to your enemies if they're your enemies and they're, they're you know, miles away bombing you. Um, so if something tells me there's got to, it's got to be possible. The enemies that you love, they got to be in proximity or at least love them enough to pray for them, pray for their salvation. Now, I will pray for the, the salvation of my enemies, but that doesn't mean I'm not going to fight them right. yeah. if I need to. Because I also, I got to love not just them, I got to love the people that they might be coming after that I'm going to stand in the way of. I'm going to pretend. Right? So I got to love them too. So I think, you know, when Jesus says something like that, I think we, we, we could talk about it. And again, scripture interprets scripture and look at all the things that Jesus talked about. Look at all the things that are in the scriptures. And we find that um, there is a time to, to fight. And uh, uh, you, you stand up against these folks. Now, Nehemiah, I get why he prayed that way. Um, Nothing, there's, there's nothing in here that says, Nehemiah, shame on you, terrible prayer. But we'd be led to think, maybe that's not how we should have prayed. Um, but you know what? We weren't in his shoes. Well, there's an Irish prayer. What was that? Well, it's, I can't repeat it, repeat it totally, but it's like, God, for those who are with me, uh, thank you. And for those who are against me, Turn their hearts. Yeah. And God, if sure. more turn their hearts, please turn their ankles so I'll know them. By <laughs> there, so I know them by the Olympic. I remember that one. <laughs> That's right. I remember hearing that one. Yeah. Yeah. I get it. But isn't, isn't that true? If, if, if you were to pray for your enemy to see the light, accept the truth as you know it, it would weaken their resolve. And they, they would be, I mean, imagine, imagine the Muslims who hate you just because you're not Muslim. If suddenly the light went on, they would be so conflicted, they wouldn't know which way was up. Sure, sure. <sighs> well, yeah, Kamal Salim talked about that. Yeah, right. When he, when his, when he was, his heart was turning yeah. toward Christ, he, he was like so conflicted because, yeah. you know, he hated these people yeah. that were taking care of him, but yet he loved them. Yeah, yeah right. Yeah. Sure. You know, and, and I got to say this, uh, you know, you think of you think of wars and I'll just use the old World War II as, a, as an example. Uh, we had a lot of Chris, Christian servicemen, you know, that went on over and fought and died and they were fighting the Nazis. Um, you know what? Um, I'm glad they did. And if we didn't, we'd all be speaking German, you know. Um, and there, there is a time to fight. And here's the thing, what this, this chapter is famous for exactly that. It's the Old Testament, we might say the right to bear arms, because this is, just, just watch what's happening here. Okay, because they're not stupid. Um, they know they've got to take precautions, they've got to defend themselves, so let's keep going. Um, and I think this will all make uh, more sense. So uh, verse six, Somebody read uh, verse 6 through 9. So we rebuilt the wall till all of it reached half its height, for the people worked with all their heart. But when Sanballat, Tobiah, the Arabs, the Ammonites, and the people of Ashdod heard that the repairs to Jerusalem's walls had gone ahead and that the gaps were being closed, they were very angry. 
They all plotted together to come and fight against Jerusalem and stir up trouble against it. But we prayed to our God and posted a guard day and night to meet this threat. All right. So um, they, 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 were, they just started rebuilding the wall. Um, and they get to the place where it's joined together to half its height. That's, that's significant. So all of Jerusalem now is, uh, is circled. There is a border wall, half of what it, it will need to be. Um, and, you know, a common enemy and a common cause brings four different groups together. Is, that's what you read, to, to stop the work on the walls of Jerusalem. And the city is completely surrounded, not by the wall uh, only, but by these enemies. Um, uh, geographically, to the north, it's Sambala and the Samaritans. To the east, it's Tobiah, the Ammonites. To the south, it's Geshem and the Arabs. To the west, it's these Ashdodites. Uh, Ashdod, uh, that was a Philistine city. Uh, and it's the, the Christian Crusaders, you know, good old Crusaders. They're the ones that actually gave the name Palestine. Um, and they were referring to the Philistines. Because don't forget, when we, when we hear about Palestine, free Palestine, uh, that is how we say today, Philistia. I mean, because it's the Philistia. Because it's the, the Philistines, which the most famous was Goliath the Philistine. Uh, still ain't, still uh, enemies today. So... Um, it, it, it's, it's interesting. I look at this and I go, you know, God's people sometimes have difficulty working together. But why is it that the people of the world have no problem uniting in opposition to the work of God? And the work of God people. I mean, think of the united forces against our values. You already know what they are? Don't have to go into them. So, Nehemiah, he says... Um, they all prayed, verse 9, you saw that. Uh, they all prayed, and they didn't just pray, what did they do? Seven Alright, they put some of their workers on guard duty. Uh, but that actually increases the work for the remaining workers. And here we go, somebody read verse 10 to 14, please. Uh, mm -hmm. Let's go 10, all the way to 23. Who, who's got that one? I got it. Go. Then Judah said, the strength of the laborers is failing. And there is so much rubbish that we are not able to build the wall. And our adversaries said that they will neither know nor see anything till we come into their midst and kill them and cause the work to cease. So it was when the Jews who dwelt near them came that they told us ten times, from whatever place you turn, they will be upon us. Therefore, I positioned men behind the lower parts of the wall at the openings, and I set people according to their families, with their swords, their spears, and their bows. And I looked and arose and said to the nobles, to the leaders, and to the rest of the people, Do not be afraid of them. Remember the Lord, great and awesome, and fight for your brethren, your sons, your daughters, your wives, and your houses. And it happened when our enemies heard that it was known to us, and that God had brought their plot to nothing, that all of us return to the wall, everyone to his work. So it was from the time, from that time on, that half of my servants worked at construction, while the other half held the spears, the shields, the bows, and wore armor. And the leaders were behind all the house of Judah. Those who built on the wall and those who carried burdens loaded themselves so that with one hand they worked at construction and with the other held a weapon. Every one of the builders had his sword girded at his side as he built. And the one who sounded the trumpet was beside me. Then I said to the nobles, the rulers, and the rest of the people, The work is great and extensive, and we are separated far from one another on the wall. Wherever you hear the sound of the trumpet, rally to us there. Our God will fight for us. So we want you to say all, all, right? all the way to 23. Go to 23. Oh, I'm sorry. So we labored in the work, and half the men held the spears from daybreak until the stars appeared. At the same time, I also said to the people, let each man and his servants stay at night in Jerusalem, that they may be our guard by night and a working party by day. So neither I, my brethren, my servants, nor the men of the guard who followed me took off our clothes, except that everyone took them off for washing. All right, allow me to summarize. What you read was that uh, the Jews who lived outside of Jerusalem near the enemies, they heard rumors of this massive uh, all-out attack. 
And uh, they repeated, repeatedly warned that the attack would come from all directions, so simultaneously. Uh, that generated fear in Jerusalem. Nehemiah, he stations guards um, in these spots where they could easily be seen um, over the low walls. Uh, you call that counter-intimidation. Uh, he arms all the workers, all of them, and he places them with their family groups and that would create uh, the greatest incentive to fight, right? Because he's going, fight for your sons, your, your daughters, your wives, guys. Um, when he saw their fear, Nehemiah, he reminded the builders that God is great and awesome. You know, um, don't forget our God. I mean, uh, he, he's going to be with us. The rulers, um, it says they were stationed behind the workers. So they're, you might say they're directing, they're encouraging them. Those with the job of loading and carrying materials uh, handed them with, with, handled them with one hand. With the other hand, they, they got a sword. Uh, I mean, think about. It. I mean, those of us who you know. I mean, today's sword is the, is the sidearm, mm -hmm. and so you got your sidearm in one hand, you know, and you got your hammer in this hand. And I just think about, that's kind of tough to do. Yeah. You know, uh, and if you're, I mean, if you're working uh, modern day, let's say mortar, I mean, what it's like to, you know, you're the, the one handed work. They're literally what we call um, today. You know, you keep, you keep around in your chamber. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you are always ready. Yeah. That's them. It's always in their hand. The equivalent would be, we're literally in a place where any moment they could hop over. They don't even want to have time to, to draw that sword, they want it in their hand, ready to go. Golly! But if somebody is looking at that, if they're able to see it, they, they go. They're they're carrying, not just open carry. Their their pistols are in their hands. I mean, they're ready to unload on us. Okay, well, that maybe that's not a bad idea. Uh, those who had to use both hands, because some jobs required you had to have both hands, uh, hung their swords, it says, hung them on their sides. They're the ones that just kept them right here. Still, right there, quick, easy to grab. Uh, the man with the shofar, he's standing right near Nehemiah, and he'd be able to signal the workers to rally wherever in case there is an attack. And, you know, there's a shofar. That's a Yemenite shofar right there. It's from the, the kudu. You've shot one or two or 15 of them, Bill. Only one, only one. You've shot only one of them. So far. So far. So far, so far. Did you? That's why they call it so far. That's why they call it so far. Sorry. And, um, you know, he keeps encouraging them that pretty much God would fight for them in any showdown with the, Ameri the, the Samaritans. And um, half of his men, what we saw, uh, they're on guard throughout the day. At night, he encourages his men to remain within the city and never to remove their clothes, meaning their military gear. Mm -hmm. If you got armor on, sorry guys, you're sleeping with on. Yeah, you, know, you see in the pictures of our servicemen and women, we're there. Sometimes they're sleeping under, under you know, the Humvee, or wherever, and they, the jacket's on, you know, the plate carrier's on, they never take it off. Something else, for Pastor Scott. Mm. If the enemy has to come across the wall, they are totally exposed. They are at the disadvantage yeah. because these people are grounded mm. and set. And I mean, and now somebody has to you know, even half the height is probably pretty high. So, yeah. So you have to scramble yeah. up and scramble across. Yeah, you would. Which means you're totally exposed. Yeah, you would. Bad yeah. Place. Yeah. The wall's pretty darn high if you've been over there. And it's also wide, isn't it? Yeah, pretty wide. It's not just up yeah. and right down. You got. Yeah. Yeah, it's pretty, it's pretty significant. Mm -hmm. When looking at those walls over there that you've seen that are finished, mm -hmm. it was halfway up, uh, uh, requiring at least 12 foot ladders, that sort of thing, to get up and over. Oh, yeah, at least, right? Yeah, yeah. 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 So um, it's not just enough to build a wall, they've got to be on guard, you know, lest the enemy take it from them. Uh, so building and battling, they're both normal part of even the Christian life, right? We're building, but we're also battling. Um, and we've got to be prepared because you never know what's going to come after you. Um, and we're going to talk about that. I think we're going to get to it. Um, uh, real quick, you've heard my message on self-defense. If you haven't, I'd encourage you to do it. It's called a biblical defense for self-defense. Um, but real quick, 
uh, Gandhi, I don't know if you ever heard Gandhi say this. A lot of people think Gandhi's just wonderful, everything he said. He said some good things, but he said this. He said regarding the Jews in World War II, he said they should have literally jumped off a cliff, committed collective suicide, rather than allow the Nazis to slaughter them, and by so doing, they would have given the world an example of moral greatness. Now, I would say, uh, when their guns were confiscated, you know, they, they, when that was starting to happen, they should never have given them up and they should have used them. Well, they did you know. Masada. Right? They did. Masada, been there. That was quite the trip, too. Uh, yeah, they didn't want to, they didn't want to be, they didn't, they didn't let the Romans kill them, they killed themselves. Yeah, there wasn't enough to them, so they, they would have been slaughtered, but... Uh, Horrific. Chapter 5. Uh, somebody, the first five verses. And before you read that, I'll tell you this. <laughs> when the enemy fails their attack on the outside, uh, they begin the attack from the inside. That's what we're going to see here. And, and, and uh, here we go. And, and one of the favorite weapons of the enemy in a church, and here in this situation, was selfishness. Watch this. Somebody, first four, five verses. And there was a great outcry of the people and their wives against their Jewish brethren. For there were those who said, We, our sons and our daughters, are many. Therefore let us get grain, that we may eat and live. There were also some who said, We have mortgaged our lands and vineyards and houses, that we might buy grain because of the famine. There were also those who said, We have borrowed money for the king's tax on our, tri on our lands, and vineyards. Yet now our flesh is as the flesh of our brother, our children as their children, and indeed we are forcing our sons and daughters to be slaves, and some of our daughters have been brought into slavery. If it, if it, is, it is not in our power to redeem them, for other men have our lands and vineyards. You catch this? So in the midst of rebuilding the wall, some of the Jews began to protest, not against their enemies, the Samaritans and all them, the Ammonites, Arabs, but against other Jews that were exploiting Jews. And I think I saw four economic classes involved. Verse 2, we find the first is husbands and wives. They got a lot of kids. They couldn't afford to feed them. Saw that? Verse 3, there's a second group. They're landowners. They had mortgage to property in order to buy food. Looks like um, the combination of debt and inflation was wiping out their equity. Got it? Four, verse 4 uh, shows us a third group complaining because taxes to the king of Persia was too high. They had to borrow money to pay them. And to borrow money they had to give security which eventually led to them losing their property. You see this? Five, we find the culprits. There's a fourth group. They're wealthy Jews who were exploiting the others by loaning money and then taking their lands and children for collateral. Wow! That kind of happens to, to countries, don't it? Okay? Uh, you know, it's not against Jewish law to loan money uh, to other Jews, but it was against Jewish law to charge interest. That's in Deuteron Deuteronomy 23. Uh, and, and it's against the law, God's law, to make another Jew a slave. That's Leviticus 25. In verses 6 and 7, somebody read 6 and 7. And I became very angry when I heard their outcry in these words. After serious thought, I rebuked the nobles and the rulers and said to them, Each of you is exacting usury from his brother. So I called a great assembly against them. Okay, so he, he consults with himself, right? He thinks it over. Uh, his decision appeared, apparently was to publicly confront the nobles, these officials, uh, this upper class, these leaders, the ones who were charging interest and all. Verse 8, and I said to them, as far as we were able, we have bought back our Jewish kindred who had been sold to other nations, but now you are selling your own kin who must then be bought back by us. Short memories, huh? All right. Gosh, they were silent, says, and they couldn't find a word to say. Well, good. <laughs> right? They should be speechless because they realized that they were enslaving some of the very own people that just got out of slavery in Babylon. They had no conscience. 
Verse 9, so I said, the thing that you're doing is not good. Should you not walk in the fear of our God to prevent the taunts of the nations of our enemies? He's pretty much saying, God's watching you. And he's also saying, unbelieving nations are also watching. They've already got enough, they're making fun of us over, but we start doing this to ourselves. They're not even doing that to their own people. This is incredible. Verse 10. So let me read 10. In fact, 10, 11, and 12. And likewise I, my brothers and my servants, are lending, lending them money and grain. Please let us leave off this usury. Please give back to them this very day their fields, their vineyards, their olive groves, and their houses. Also the hundredth part of the money and of the grain, the new wine and the oil that you're exacting from them. Then they said, we will give it back and will require nothing from them. We will do exactly as you say. Mm -hmm. So I called the priests and took an oath from them that they would do according to this promise. Okay, so he's telling them, uh, these folks who you've taken everything from, they need money and food from somebody. And we're the ones having to give from our reserves. You're, you're costing us. And he says, you need to give it all back. And, uh, you know, apparently they were shamed enough where they promised they would. Verse 13. Um, somebody read 13. I like this. <laughs> I shook out the folds of my robe and said, if you fail to keep your promise, may God shake you like this from your homes and your property. Pretty much he emptied out his pockets. That would be the equivalent. So, like, if we were to turn our pockets inside out and coins fall out, he goes, you know, just a little demonstrative thing there. He goes, that's what God's going to do to you. He's going to take everything from you. He's going to shake you free of uh, your land and your money if you don't return what you've taken. Uh, all right. Uh, and then 14 to 19. Um, let, let me just uh, summarize it as you read it. Okay. You read 14 to 19. And what you're reading is his own personal practice. And he is saying that from the time that he was appointed to be their governor, which is 12 years, neither he nor his brothers ate the food allowance of the governor, because they're they supposed to be allowed to receive this food allowance. Former governors uh, laid heavy burdens on the people, and they took food, wine, money from them. But Nehemiah, he doesn't. He says you know, it's because of the fear of God. Uh, Oswald Chambers, he said, when you fear God, you fear nothing else. Whereas if you do not fear God, you fear everything else. He also said, a, a guilty conscience will rob you of the spiritual authority you need to give proper leadership. But every sacrifice you've made will give you the extra strength you need to defeat the enemy. Isn't that true? You got a guilty conscience, your spiritual authority begins to go away, doesn't it? If you know you're working hard and you're sacrificing and, and you know God's watching it and it's not, you're not doing it for ego or because God's watching, but um, when you know you're doing what you should be doing, it actually, it adds to your authority. You just, you just will sense a power to your prayers and you will sense God leveraging his power on your behalf, uh, unlike uh, you'd experience him not doing so if you're walking in willful sin, okay? Uh, from verse 16, uh, Nehemiah, you know, his cabinet, they didn't bark orders from, you know, chase lounges under umbrellas. They work on the wall, looked like everybody else. He says, you know, we not only paid, I didn't only pay for my own food, uh, but I shared what I had with everybody else. And daily, it says he fed over what? Oh, gosh. Do you understand what he's doing? He's all in. He's leading by example. He himself fed over 150 people, both the residents and visitors from other nations, every day. Daily. Gosh. So the stuff that he, how, wherever he's getting that, where's he getting the rations? Where's he getting the food? Whatever he's doing, he's gathering it. He's working hard to do it so he can take care of people that can't take care of themselves. Verse 19. He's talking to God. Remember for my good, oh my God, all that I've done for this people. Like, God, don't, please don't for, forget me. I, I'm working. I'm tr truly trying to do all that I can um, 
for my people, your people. Okay. Uh, chapter 6. Yeah, Bill. It talks about visitors from other countries. If they were surrounded on four sides by enemies, who, who might those people be and how would they People who probably would have come up nicely and said, I'm not an enemy. You know, I you know I, I support you guys. Can I you know can I come in and hang out with you? Or maybe we're hurting, we're suffering. Um, we're not your enemy, but can you help us? And willing to help. And yeah, they're willing. So there must have been some sort of a vetting process, you know, that would have allowed them in the the city walls. Uh, so here's here's chapter six now. Um, Um, somebody read first four verses. Now it happened. Well, go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> Arm wrestle. Now it happened when Sanballat, Tobiah, Geshem, the Arab, and the rest of our enemies heard that I had rebuilt the wall and that there were no breaks left in it, though at that time I had hung, I had not hung the doors in the gates that Sanballat and Geshem sent to me saying, Come, let us meet together among the villages in the plain of Ono. But they thought to, to do me harm. Mm. So I sent messengers to them saying, I am doing a great work so that I cannot come down. Why should the work cease while I leave it and go down to you? But they sent me this message four times and I answered them in the same manner. Okay, stop there. So up to this point, the building program, Sambala. He and his friends, they, they failed in their earlier attempts to stop the, the people from working, so they decided to concentrate their attacks now on Nehemiah. We're going to go for the leadership. We're going to try to cut the head off the, the snake. Okay. Uh, so they offered to meet Nehemiah where? Okay. In the plain of, oh no. All right. um, in this village, it's halfway between Jerusalem and Samaria, uh, a quiet place where they can make plans on how to work together. Right? Like, we're willing to meet you halfway. What together? Right? Like that, that was their approach. A little bit late. Now. Yeah, right? But that, literally, that's, that's their approach. You know, we're willing to meet you halfway kind of thing. Uh, now, these men, they knew how well guarded Nehemiah was. So there was no attacking him in public. So this is an, a, an attempt to get him alone. Nehemiah knows they're, you know, they're lying. They, they want to kill him. Okay. Uh, it's a, just this is a little too obvious. In chapter 4, you know, these men, they were talk, talking smack. They're insulting both the people and the quality of the work. Remember that? And then when that didn't stop the Jews from rebuilding the, the perimeter walls, they threatened an all-out attack on the city. These same guys. So what's with the sudden friendly approach? Who are they fooling? You're catching this. Right. Okay? Okay. Uh, now, Satan was behind this, you know, uh, and he, he, used this, he used four strategies in attacking Nehemiah, uh, and we're going to see them right now. Strategies that he still uses against us, and he still uses against spiritual leaders today. I want you to pay attention. All right? The first one is guile. Be wary, be, be aware of the smiles of the enemy. Okay? What's the term? Guile. Oh, God. Okay, so Satan is, is more dangerous than he appears um, when he appears to be your friend than at any other time. Yes. Right? Yeah. So, uh, four friendly invitations come to meet with Nehemiah. Nehemiah refuses them all, and that's good because he stayed on the job. And I'll just say, when Satan invites you to quit and you don't, God will bless you. Here's the second strategy. Ready? Slander. Okay, somebody read five through nine. Five and, you know, all the way through, nine, including nine. The fifth time Sambal's servant came with an open letter in his hand, and this is what it said. <clears throat> Geshem tells me that everywhere he goes, he hears that you and the Jews are planning to rebel, and that is why you are building the wall. According to his reports, you plan to be their king. He also reports that you have appointed prophets to prophesy about you in Jerusalem, saying, look, there is a king in Judah. You can be very sure that this report will get back to the king. So I suggest that you come and talk it over with me. 
Uh, <clears throat> my reply was, you know, you are lying. There is no truth in any part of your story. They were just trying to intimidate us, imagining that they could break our resolve and stop the work. So I prayed for strength to continue the work. Hmm. All right. So when Nehemiah refuses to meet with Sambalat, Sambalat sends a letter, and its content is right here for us to read. It's in quotes. That's another reason why I like Nehemiah's journal. I mean, he, he puts in it the, act, the details are just wonderful. This book just comes alive, right? So, uh, and, and Sambalat says, what? Rumors are going around, Nehemiah, that... That what? That, that you've actually built the wall because you're... Getting ready to rebel. You're going to lead a rebellion because you're planning to make yourself king and have prophets do what prepare to announce your coronation yeah. oh my gosh uh I, I will remind you that our lord jesus was accused by his enemies of the very thing same thing mm -hmm. yep. so sambala he pretends to inform nehemiah i love this like he informs him of this as his friend Right? And Sambala, he states that it was his duty. You know, it's my, you know, it's my duty to inform the king of Persia about this. I mean, you know that I have to report these kinds of things, Nehemiah. And so in effect, he's saying, Nehemiah, uh, I'm in a position to help you out of this. Because you don't want word of this getting out. And we can just put a stop to this. So why don't you come and meet with me? Because this is a fifth attempt to get Nehemiah alone. Okay. Uh, I want you to remember that both Sanballat and Nehemiah are governors. Sanballat's a governor too. And correspondence, by the way, uh, between two governors, that would be in a sealed scroll. But Sanballat sent what kind of a letter? An open letter. An open letter. So it's actually an unsealed scroll. It's unrolled, and it could be read by anybody along the way. And, and by who was carrying it? And probably the person announcing what he's carrying on the way to Nehemiah, he's making it very clear that anybody can come and see this thing, this, this official government business between two governors. And by the way, this is where we get the term an open letter. So it's actually for anybody's eyes. And Sambala, he wanted the public to know the contents of the letter before it even got to Nehemiah. Why? Put pressure on him. Yes, that's why he says, that's why it says this. It was an open letter on purpose. He's hoping to undermine Nehemiah's reputation and authority. You know, if some of the Jewish workers believed what was in the letter, that would start to create division in the ranks. What's he doing? What? He brought us here to, oh my gosh. He's having us break our backs, working on the wall, da 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 da, because actually we're building his kingdom because he he's wants to be king. Oh my gosh, we've been fooled. Don't believe that kind of stuff. It's amazing what people will say about leaders. Right. Okay? Um, so, you know, statements like, it's been reported, and they say. Okay, okay, that's in this. Listen, those, those statements that have caused so, many, so much trouble in so many churches. And, and if Satan can discredit a Christian leader, he can cripple a ministry. He can discredit the cause of Jesus. Yep. Happens all the time. Is Samuel like trying to court favor too with, with the king? I mean, if, if he can get Nehemiah to stop or kill him, even better, then he'd go to the king and say, look, look what I did. Possibly, but I mean, he's definitely on his own mission. You know? Um... Now, unless he lied to the king and said, hey, I stopped him from trying to create his own kingdom and make himself king. Just, oh, yeah. I, I did that for you. And then, yeah, he'd, mm. he'd get some bumps or whatever in his pay. <coughs> mm. Now, um, how could Nehemiah uh, have responded? I mean, he simply could have, what, sent word back? That he knew that the so-called rumors were started by Sambalat. I mean, he said, you're, invented, you're inventing these out of your own mind. Okay, and that is, by the way, where slander always begins. It begins in somebody's mind. Somebody starts thinking about something and they start to say it. 
it's, it's in their own mind. It's their own imagination. They start to spread it, and then other people don't really think about it or care to research it themselves, and they just believe it, and if they spread it, they can get real ugly. Okay, so uh, uh, Nehemiah, he writes in his journal right here that he knew the slander was, was to frighten and discourage the, the wall builders, and their ultimate goal was to stop the work. So Nehemiah, uh, he went again to God in prayer, didn't he? Did you notice? He just, he, this happens and he goes right to God. Absolutely. He doesn't, you know, go like this, you know, in his room, lock himself and just kind of get all stirred up and all scared and, oh, what am I going to do? He just goes right to God. God, you're bigger than this. You can handle this. Strengthen my hands, he says. Just make me stronger. I, I don't want to give up. Help me not even be tempted to give up. Uh, these are just signs that this must be your work. Hey, have you ever had that? Something comes against you, and you, you interpret it correctly. You say, you know, these are just signs to me. It's confirmation. I'm doing the right thing because I'm getting attacked. Amen. 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 Right? Okay. Okay. A lot of you doing a lot of stuff. You know, I, when, I, when I watch, you know, some of our peeps, you know, like Amy steps in there and heads up the Pennington County Republican Party. And, you know, the number of our people there... The attacks were right away, and the accusations right away, and the stuff was even leveled against this church against me. Mm -hmm. Trying to take over. He's trying to take over, and somehow I'm the puppet master behind you guys. Did, did you hear that? Did you not know that? That was a rumor. What? What are you talking about? It, the Lord laid it on their hearts. They ran. They just so happened to come to this church. They're part of this church family. They're leadership in this church family, and we're doing what the Bible says to do. And uh, you know, some people they're gonna. Out of their own minds, do whatever, and um, and you know they, all the accusations I was hearing it all. How you all did this and intimidated, and whatever you did to kick out all these people. No, you you did what anybody could do. You yeah, you 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 did what anybody does. You run, and you you did a better job, and you got the votes and you won. And it was shocking. And it was shocking. It was. It was me. And word before the sun set, I get a phone call. From the guy who's the chair of the state Republican Party going, um, so what happened today? I heard you. <laughs> I go, I did nothing. I was there. I watched the votes. I prayed. I, I, I'm there encouraging our people who decided to run. But, yep, these folks ran. Most were from our church. Others not. But that's now the leadership. And, um. I like my name. Yeah, you know. <laughs> So, um, but it's amazing how fast word traveled. And I mean, it was already in Pier, it was, a, it was in Sioux Falls, and I get a phone call. You heard it the same day, too. I got a call that night. What are you doing? How did you do? Yeah. So, all, all that happened is somebody brought forward a slate that was sickening. And Tina Moali, God bless her, was the impetus behind gathering the right people to run and run they did and ran we'll run the others day. out of town. <clears throat> right? So, right? It was amazing. The right, the right thing happened. Yeah. For the right reason. Yeah. It was amazing. Scott would have so, hmm. a, perhaps a paraphrase of what Nehemiah responded could have sounded something like this. You all are fake news <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and you are turning people who did support me. Right. <clears throat> to give them doubt, yeah. second thoughts yeah. on whether they should continue to support me. Absolutely. Wow, right? Greatest example in our lifetime right there. So, uh, again, don't believe everything you read or hear about Christian leaders. I mean, you've got to consider the source. Uh, you've got to firmly refuse to accept as truth anything that can't be documented. Period. You just, you just you got to make that decision and then stick with it. Uh, Christian leaders, they also they need to know how to handle false accusations. Uh, or vicious letters, unfounded press reports, uh, gossip. Otherwise, uh, those kind of things are going to so upset a Christian leader that they can lose perspective. And they're going to spend all their time uh, defending themselves, uh, sick to the stomach, worried that you know, they're going to lose what has been built, etc. They're going to start to neglect their work. So Sanballat, he wants Nehemiah to stop the work to defend his reputation. Did you catch it? Yeah. That, that's, a, that's a good tactic. But Nehemiah didn't make that mistake. 
He knew his character was such that no honest person would, be able to, would believe the false reports. And I'll say this, if we take care of our character, uh, we can trust God to take care of our reputation. Wow. Yeah, want to say that again? Yeah, yeah. yeah. If, if we take care of our character, we can trust God to take care of our reputation. Okay, and this whole church, I, I think that's, that's our MO too. All right, verse 10, if somebody will read 10 through 14. One day I went into the house of Shemaiah, son of Eliah, son of Mehetabel, who was confirmed to his house. He said, let us meet together in the house of God within the temple and let us close the doors of the temple, for they are coming to kill you. Indeed, tonight they are coming to kill you. But I said, should a man like me run away? Would a man like me go into the temple to save his life? I will not go in. Then I perceived and saw that God had not sent him at all. Mm. But he had pronounced the prophecy against me because Tobiah and Sanballat had hired him. He was hired for this purpose to intimidate me and to make me sin by acting this way so that they could give me a bad name in order to taunt me. Remember Tobiah and Sinbalat, O oh my God, according to these things that they did, and also the prophetess, uh, Noadiah, and the rest of the prophets who wanted to make me afraid. Okay. Man. This is so good. So Sanballat and his goons, they leave no stone unturned. The third strategy was to use threats. Yeah. And uh, a man of God respects the word of God, right? His enemies thought that uh, he might be lured into making a wrong move by the word of a prophet. Because they know Nehemiah respects the word of God. Yeah. Written word or the word from a prophet. By the way, this Sunday is part two of our looking at spiritual gifts in 1 Corinthians 12, 13, 14. Chapter 14, in the very first verse, Paul says... You know, um, strive to make love, which again was the greatest of all spiritual gifts. Chapter 13, you know, uh, top priority in your searching for gifts. And he says, you know, seek gifts, you know, be open to them, ask God, you know, give me however. But then he says, especially that you may prophesy, prophesy out of all the gifts. And I, I'm excited for this anymore. He says if there's a gift you want to ask for as if apparently you, you can ask for that one what's prophecy prophecy is God speaking to you and then through you to other people that's what it is so prophecy God speaks um, I will uh, tell you now that as we see right here prophecy is a spiritual gift is it not yeah. It's Paul says so in, in 1 Corinthians. Well, if it's in the Old Testament, spiritual gifts were active in the Old Testament. Right. Of course they were. What was the predominant spiritual gift in the Old Testament? Prophecy. Prophecy. God speaking. Then you had the four years of silence, 400 years of silence between Malachi and Matthew. Because he told Amos there's going to be a famine of the, of the words of hearing the words of God. Meaning God's not going to speak. No prophecy for 400 years. We get to the New Testament, the Jews are going, we're dying to get a word from God. We want to hear, where's that prophecy? Uh, again, people are starving today. I starve for it. I, I want to hear God speak. Wow. Don't you? I want, to hear, I want to hear a word from God. Because I, I, I believe the word of God. And, and, and if God is truly speaking a word of prophecy to me directly or through somebody, as Paul's going to show us, if somebody does that, it can't just be one. You need to have a few prophets, people who... You might say can be trusted that God speaks to them reliably and they're all lined up all saying we believe God is saying this to you. Okay, then I can rely on that. You can rely on that. Uh, and so they know Nehemiah believes God's word and he would listen to a prophet. So they send him wisely a prophet. But he's not from God. But he's not from God because Nehemiah, it says, recognizes, wait, hey, this ain't from God. Now, do you know the difference from a prophecy that's from God and not from God? There's a lot of people out there claiming to be prophets. Yep. Do you know how to identify a real one? 
It lines up with the Word of God. Mm -hmm. That's one of the things you can do. Okay. Discernment is a gift, too. Uh, discernment is a gift, too. Okay? And we may or may not cover all that this Sunday. We'll see. <laughs> Bring a lunch. Bring a lunch. Okay. But can I keep you a little longer so we can finish chapter 6? Yeah. It won't take long. All right. So, did you catch, I love this, this picture, what happened here. Follow me closely. All right? Follow this. <clears throat> the enemy's attempt now is to use Nehemiah's own people against him. This man... Shemaya, 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 he locks himself where? It said he locked himself in his own house, and that was to give an impression that, like Nehemiah, his life was in danger. Hey, Nehemiah, they're after both of us. Mm. But in reality, he's working for the enemy. Now, why wasn't he helping the Jews rebuild the wall? That's one thing to look at. Okay, so here's this guy. Claiming this thing to be from God when we're talking to Nehemiah. He should be working, but he's not. And you know, it pays to be cautious around so-called Christians who always have advice, but they never seem to get any work done for Christ themselves. <laughs> Do you need to hear that one again? Yeah. Yeah. It, it pays to be cautious around so-called Christians who always have advice, but never seem to get any work done for Christ themselves. Amen. Okay, so they pay this guy off, they pay this guy Shemaiah to speak as if he heard from God that Nehemiah's enemies would be coming to kill him that very evening. What's coming? Is that the president? Uh, 911 service is not working. 911 is not working. Call directly. Wow. Wow, okay. There you go. Thank you, Lord. It's not a tornado. <laughs> That's good. All right. So, he's what he pitches to Nehemiah as he's locking himself in his house. He says, What? They could lock themselves inside the temple. You and I, hey, let's, let's hide because they're after the both of us so we can be safe from our enemies. And the hope, as Nehemiah sees it, was to discredit Nehemiah in the eyes of his followers as a terrified leader who, who commanded everybody else to be bold, but he himself runs and turns tail, he hides at the, the nearest threat against his own life. Yeah. You got that? Yeah. Right. So the greatest harm our, our spiritual or physical enemies can do to us really is to frighten us away from our duty and, and to tempt us yeah. to do what is wrong. Uh, Adolf Hitler, he said this, Mental confusion, contradiction of feeling, indecisiveness, panic, these are our weapons. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mental confusion, contradiction of feeling, indecisiveness, panic, these are our weapons. That's a weapon, no wonder he said because that's a weapon to the devil. All right, so uh, this had the devil's fingerprints all over it because uh, think about this, he, he's our tempter, right? And, and he's our tempter so that he can become our accuser once we've given it to the temptation. That's why he wants to do it. He wants you actually to, he wants to tempt you so that he can then, this is his main thing. Not just so you sin. He tempts you so that once you give in, he can turn and go, how dare you do that? How could you do that? Look at you. How could you claim to be or whatever? Yeah. I own you. Right? Yeah, they, he, he really does. He, he owns you. Um, so, um... That is how Satan glories in our shame. Did, did you know that's how the enemy is glorified? Did it ever occur to you that, you know how we talk about God getting glory from us? Do you know how the devil gets glory from us? It's when we're sh feeling shamed. When, when we're just crippled by guilt. He loves that. Because then we, we recoil. We don't have boldness. We don't have authority. We just want to hide. And we go, who, who am I? God, how can you use me? Look at these terrible things I've done. How can you forgive me? How can you love me? How can you have grace for me? Or, or it's a sin you might have committed over and over and over. And you just, you just say, there's no way. You, I clearly, I've run, out, I've run out your forgiveness quota. You know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Makes me think of screw tape letters. Oh, screw tape letters. Yeah. If you haven't read that lately, read it again. Lord Falgren's Letters is actually a, a modern take on it by Randy Alcorn. If anybody's read that, it's, a, it's another, like, like C.S. Lewis's Screwtape Letters. 
So, um, um, <laughs> we shame the devil when we call upon the blood of Jesus for forgiveness, don't we? And, and restoration, and then God is glorified. Come on. Right? So that's how we shame him. When, when he starts, again, making you feel terrible, which maybe you should, but only for a while, until you, you turn to Jesus and you say, I've got to claim the blood of, me, of the, the blood of Christ. Your, your blood, Lord, one more time. I need that all over me. I need that to wash me clean of my sin. Amen. And uh, last time I checked, first, you know, First John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from some unrighteousness. Oh. Most unrighteousness. Oh. All unrighteousness. Hallelujah. If we confess, we agree with God. I did this. He knows. He saw it. You're not telling something he didn't know, but you tell him, I'm aware of this. I'm not trying to get by with it. I, I did this. Then he is faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us, cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So we got a clean slate. So take that devil. And the devil has nothing to use later. Devil has nothing to use. Amen. Yeah. And, 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 and if he reminds you of that, because sometimes you know, he, he does that too. And you remind yourself of your past sins, but he'll remind you. And if he reminds you of your sins, you just got to remind him that they already paid for. That's the thing. I got to, got to, got to go over this again. Sins can only be paid for once. Right? Yes or no? Right. Okay, go on. So if, if either he paid for him or you pay for him, but you both can't pay for him. Right. So again, um, he was punished for him. We get disciplined if we sin, but God doesn't punish us. He disciplines us. He was punished for our sin. They're paid for. Hallelujah. Amen. That's the only way you can get back up on the battlefield. Otherwise, those wounds that you'll get, the self-inflicted ones, or what the enemy gets, shoots at you, you'll, you'll, you'll die on the battlefield. Yeah. Unless you claim that. And medic! Yeah. He's, he's the medic. Right? Healer. Right? Amen. And then, boop, you're back up. Let's go. Okay, almost done. Can you hang in here? Okay, almost done. Almost done. So Nehemiah, he lets it know that, uh, you know, he's not about to run away in the face of danger. Verse 11, he, but I said, should a man like me run away? Would a man like me go into the temple to save his life? I will not go in. Verse 3, he already told him, I cannot leave, right? Now he says, I will not run. Verse 11, I cannot leave and I will not run. Nehemiah, he was a true shepherd. He's not a hireling like this Shemaiah. Okay, so Nehemiah, he also knew that only priests could go beyond the altar of the burnt, burnt offering and then into the temple, which was out, out, out front, the, the altar. So it's forbidden for anybody other than priests to enter the temple. That's why he goes, can a man like me go into the temple? He's going, I am a Levite. I'm not a priest. You you're, you're asking me to go to a place that's forbidden. Mm -hmm. Only a priest can go in there. Yeah, that's Numbers 18, verse 7, by the way, that gives us that, that law. Uh, verse 14 it shows us there's this conspiracy against Nehemiah among the prophets. Did you catch it? Um, including a prophetess named Noadia. Don't know who she is, that's all we know, but the idea was that, that created a lot of pressure for Nehemiah. Because the Jews had great respect for their prophets. So the rest of the prophets wanted to make him afraid, it said. What? No, this Noadia and, and a whole bunch of others were, were going with a Shemaiah guy? Well, then what kind of prophets were they? I mean, God did not deliver that word to them. Shambhala did. So, Nehemiah, luckily, he knows the difference between a real and a false prophet. Because what? Even if a lot... Here's something you know, we're going to look at chapter 14 of 1 Corinthians, where he says the spirit of prophets is subject to the prophets. So you have to have more than one prophet, um, you, know, con, you know, confirm a word is from God. Well, what if a whole bunch of prophets... All confirm a false word from God. So you, you got to be more than on your toes, more than you think when it comes to prophecy, because a whole bunch of prophets can also affirm a false prophet. So that's why I, I reserve the right to verify any word that is spoken by any prophet. And I don't care if ten of them all say the same thing. But look, they're all saying it. I don't care, right? Because I'll tell you this: God speaks to me. I got proof. Amen. Repeatedly, I got proof. God speaks to me very specifically about things. All the time, no. But I know that if God wants to speak to me about something, He can. And I've got proof. I got the receipts. 
of times that I just, I'm amazed at what he said. So do you. God speaks to you. And if God speaks to you, then you should ask, God, is that from you? Even if 10 other people supposedly say it is, I need to know, would you drop it to me directly? Um, and then there's some other things to talk about, but um, be careful what you believe. Nehemiah had to. Jennifer. Wasn't the, wasn't the thing to test the prophets in the Old Testament was that if they were truly from God, obviously it came true. It come true. If it didn't come true, weren't they like... You're to be stoned. Destroyed. Yeah, they kill you. They kill you? Okay. Yeah. Yeah, you, yeah, you don't want to... That's the thing. If Because it, it says, if even one of their prophecies does not come true, they take their life. Why we should do that now? We should do it now. <laughs> like, bring back the Old Testament. Okay. So, and, and that's another thing. Why? There are prophets today. There always has been. People are prophets. Claim to be prophets. Whatever. Um, and let's say nine out of ten of their prophecies come true. If one doesn't, Old Testament law says, because a prophet is never, ever allowed and permitted by God to deviate from a word from God. So a prophet, the moment a prophet, they're human beings, we can get a big head and go, I've heard from God on all these things. And I think this one's from God too, or maybe say something. And you cannot speak presumptuously. That's another sin. You never speak presumptuously on God's behalf. So sometimes you could think, you can kind of get carried away with your own prophetic knowledge, and I've heard it so many times. And people, uh, people who, I, and I believe, I believe I've heard some people that were, I mean, God gave, I believe God gave them a prophecy. And then they, gave, they claim God gave them another one, and another one, and another one, and I'm going, okay, this is like wacko now. Yeah. And I go, that first word was correct, but now they've deviated. Now we don't kill them. <laughs> Old Testament wise but, but you've got to go um, I've got to weigh each prophecy independent Okay Make sense? Yeah. Alright Y'all go with that? Almost done? Kind of, sort of? Can you still hang on there? Yeah. Almost done? You sound like a preacher Thank you Okay. <laughs> okay. Almost done, almost done um, So um, Yes. Um. Yep. Oh, can I see that? what you saw right there also with the prophets and all? Um, it's evil that, that anybody should be so disloyal as to betray the cause of God and their country even under the pretense of closeness with God and concern for the country. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> you got that one? Yeah, you might want to say that. That's, 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 that's what happened. Okay? Yeah. It, it's evil that anybody should be so disloyal as to betray the cause of God and their country, even under the pretense of closeness with God and concern for their country. Because yeah. these guys... They actually are coming against God and what God is doing in their own country. That happens even here, sadly. Okay, so let's uh, well, let's finish. Let's go. Um, um, let's go fifteen to the end. Somebody. So the wall was finished on the twenty-fifth day of Elu in fifty-two days, and it happened when all our enemies heard of it, and all the nations around us saw these things that they were very disheartened. In their own eyes, for they perceived that uh, this work was done by our God. Wow. Also, in those days, the nobles of Judah sent many leaders to Tobiah, and the letters of Tobiah came to them. For many in Judah were pledged to him, because he was the son in law of Shechemiah, the son of Aru, and his son Jehonahan, and married the daughter of Mary. And this, I'm just kidding. Yeah, it, it works. <laughs> I'll just see if y'all listen. <laughs> Meshulam, the son of Barakaya, Bar also reported his good deeds before me and reported my word to him to buy sent letters to frighten me. All right. Mm -hmm. 
So, uh, you know, it's like, you know, who's, who, who's talking now, right? The, the walls are completed in 52 days, uh, haven't worked in the hottest part of the year, it, it tells us. Uh, and all the enemies that were talking smack and threatening war were now the ones in fear. They actually were embarrassed because uh, the kings of Persia actually did not permit them. They, the kings of Persia didn't uh, permit the Samaritans and others from fortifying their own cities. Only the Jews were able to. That's amazing. What a carve out. And they actually realized that the work was accomplished with the help of God. Eventually, Nehemiah just goes, they actually finally had to realize our God actually, there's no other way to explain what happened than this. Number one's working. It is now or not working? They said they would do the same thing when they got it up. Okay, now it's working. Fantastic. <laughs> All right. So uh, the fourth strategy, well, right here was espionage. Um, you know, um, you know so we're not going to give up. Um, it, you know, it's this embarrassment to the enemy and. and uh, he right here says you know our leaders in judah were pretty much pen pals with tobiah and they saw him as kin because both he and his sons had married jewish women and they even tried to talk to nehemiah into having a friendship with tobiah by telling nehemiah how great tobiah was okay i mean gosh what a burden on on him so um you know they, they tried everything they can um, even it was, when it's over, they still, okay, the walls are built, but we still want to get in there and make some sort of an alliance of trust with, with a real snake guy, Tobiah, um, and do whatever we can to still intimidate and minimize what they're doing um, as this brand new, you know, rebuilt Jewish nation. And that's the end of chapter six, Bill. Is Nehemiah Hebrew for nobody's fool? Yeah, it should be, right? <laughs> right? The guy's amazing. Right? Nobody's fool. We good? Kept a long time. Thanks for staying extra. Thank you. Okay, let's pray. Lord, we just thank you for your word. We thank you for the example of Nehemiah. We thank you for the example of all the people, your people. At that time, this really happened. How amazing. They, they worked despite all of uh, the treachery, all the attempts of the enemy to stop. Father, you have called us together at this very moment in history, and we will not listen to the enemy. Uh, we won't listen to false news. Uh, we don't, we're not going to be intimidated uh, as long as you are with us. And we, we seek you. And we want to walk according to your statutes and walk in obedience to you. Whatever you call us and this church family to do, uh, we, we can be confident. If you've called us to build, there's, this church has been being built. So we thank you for the physical and spiritual building that has happened over the history of this church family and trust you to direct us in additional building. And I give you thanks for a church family that is bold and courageous and um, ready to stand against the enemy, spiritual, physical. For your glory, we pray and we thank you. Amen. 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 Thank you, everybody. Thank you.